Well, thank you for uh, for attending this conference today, and thank you for letting me be to the introductory speaker speaker to talk with you about cauda equina syndrome. And what I've been given the task is two different talks. Today's talk is going to be focused on cauda equina syndrome, and you can see I titled it as the basics. What I want to do during this talk is go through some of the basic anatomy to try to give you an understanding of what cauda equina syndrome is. And then this will lay the groundwork for the symptoms that people are having with this or as you're evaluating it. But as we go through the talks, you will understand what we're looking at and you can visualize it within the spine and understanding cauda equina as a serious condition that needs to be addressed. In tomorrow's talk, we're going to look at chronic cauda equina syndrome. And in that one, we won't, we'll be going over a little bit of the anatomy to refresh, but the key focus will be on what are the symptoms of chronic cauda equina and to lay the groundwork for the speakers afterwards to talk about what the treatment options are for that. So again, as, as regards to this, I have no conflicts relating to this. Um, I'm doing this to help you entirely. Uh, those patients with cauda equina syndrome. And the goals of my talk, as you can see, they're listed here, which we just went over, is to basically understand the basic uh, nervous system anatomy, to understand how where the cauda equina is and how it is related, why we see the symptoms that we see, and to understand that basic anatomy. We will review, again, the based on the anatomy, what type of symptoms can we see, and what type of changes do I, as a neurologist, see on your exam, or others? what will others see when they evaluate you? Okay, getting into the specifics of this, three separate sections I want to do. In the first, in talking about the anatomy of this, we want to separate the, uh, the body into three different parts. You can see I've got the nervous system is comprised of several parallel systems, and there are specific pathways for each of these parallel systems. And then within each one of these pathways, nerves have their unique structure that we're going to review each one of these. So starting with the first, the nervous system is comprised of several parallel systems. When we talk about nerves, we're just talking about nerves that extend from the brain all the way through the body. And there are three basic nervous systems. There is the sensory system, touch and feel. There's the motor system. This is the system that allows you to move your muscles, that allows you to talk. It's the muscle function. And the autonomic is a much smaller, sort of lays in the background system, but that's the one that controls your heart rate, controls your bowel and bladder, and also controls blood pressure when you stand up so you don't get dizzy or lightheaded. So you have this autonomic, the sensory, and the motor. This is a slide that sort of describes that a little bit. And you can see that those systems are going to extend from the brain, as you can see in the top section, down through the spinal cord, and they work their way out to the skin where you can have the sensory changes. And notice that they are sort of on the left side of the brain goes over to the right side of the body. So there is some cross wiring when people talk about this. And Extending that a little bit further, we talked about within each one of these sensory, motor, and autonomic, they, they each have their own specific components. That is, they start in the brain, they go to the brainstem, down to the spinal cord, and down to the peripheral nerves. This is another diagram showing that in the sensory system. You can see the red brain component, the blue as we're going through the spinal cord, and then down towards the green where you have going out to the periphery. As a result, you will see that we will talk about what's referred to, well, this is showing, I'm sorry, what is referred to as these upper nerves. These are the nerves within the brain or the lower nerves, which are the nerves outside of the brain. We'll come back to that because that's important to understanding cauda equina. But when you have this sensory system coming through from the brain, mapping down to different areas, we get this organization where this figure is showing you the different sensory levels. You can see the cervical with C are up higher, the thoracic, that's your mid chest, are at the mid position, the lumbar is the lower, and the sacral is down at the very bottom end. This And these map down with the body, which this is very important when we talk about cauda equina syndrome, understanding this. I'll come back with another slide describing it. 
So now again with cauda equina, we've talked about the different layers within the brain, the different types of nerve that are present. And now within those, I wanna talk about the upper motor nerves and the lower motor nerves. I mentioned them briefly last time, but this slide is showing us that same sort of pattern. You have these upper motor nerves that go from the brain, they come down to the spinal cord, and then at the spinal cord, they synapse with the nerves that, or they connect with the nerves that go out to the muscles. The upper nerves from the brain to the spinal cord, the lower nerves from the spinal cord to the muscles. So when we look at something like a cauda equina, which is way, you can see that down in the bottom, it's gonna have a lot of those lower motor nerve symptoms. This is the anatomy of the spine. Okay, in this slide, you can see the brain is going to be at the top of the slide. The blue is the cervical, that orange color is the thoracic, then you have the lumbar in green, and then you have the even lower segments. So the spinal cord extends from the top of this slide at C1 all the way down to that little tiny purple cone that's called the conus medullaris. And out of all of these come those lower motor nerves that go off to different areas. You can see in the thoracic they're coming off, in the cervical they're coming off at different areas, and in the lumbar. But the spinal cord ends a little bit early. It ends about that L1, L2 level. That's the L1 or L2 level of the lumbar spine. So below that level, it's all lower motor nerves. And that's what you can see if you look at that section down in those lumbar nerves that are extending out. And that is what is the cauda equina. That's what we're looking at in this slide. The cauda equina, those of you who know their Latin, it's a horse's tail. And that's exactly what it is. It's the nerves that have come off the spinal cord down at the bottom end and now are just passing through the spinal column down to the segments where they come off in order to earn, innervate the muscles. So we have this L4, L5, and you can see the S1, S2, S3. Remember when I showed you those sensory levels, I talked about the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral. This is at the bottom end of the lumbar and the bottom end of the sacral region. And here is that same little bit of a better drawing of that same organization. But you can see, remember we were talking about L4, 5, S1, S2. You, if you look at the person who's turned away from us, so the person where we see their back, you can see that those sacral areas almost form what we would describe as a saddle pattern. That is, if you were sitting on a horse, you would have that saddle where it would be uh, the, uh, along the buttocks, extending down the back end of the legs all the way down to the feet. And so you'll hear that term about saddle anesthesia that can be present. If you have something that involves this cauda equina, which remember, it's the lower nerves, L4, L5, S1, S2, you can see how in particular, if it's S1, S2, if it's the sacral roots, you're gonna get a lot of that saddle anesthesia and you're gonna get the perineal symptoms, which we'll talk a little bit more as we go into today's and tomorrow's talk. The next thing to think about is within the nerves themselves. As we talk about the causes of cauda equina when we go more into that, this will be important because if we look at those nerves that are passing through the cauda equina, they're not just simple wires coming through. They have an outer insulation. Okay, we refer to this as myelin. So you have this central core of a nerve that's called the axon, and then the outer layer of the nerve, which is the myelin that produces the insulation so it can commute, uh, so that the signal can transfer through the cauda equina. And as a result of that, you can get disease in the myelin, or you can get disease in the axon that can produce that affect the nerves to just cause the cauda equina syndrome. I wanted to show you a couple of other slides. This is not cauda equina syndrome, com something completely different. This is multiple sclerosis, but this is a demyelinating. And if you see, you can see the white spots in the middle of the brain. That's what you're looking at. There are little tiny plaques that affect that myelin level. So we will see this demyelination in something like multiple sclerosis. And this is just some a drawing of the spinal cord that shows you the spinal cord itself has this blue and red, which is the outer white matter myelin areas and the center, which is where those axons are going to be the nuclear portions of it. 
These are a couple of slides showing you. So again, getting back to this map that we showed you before of the cauda equina, you can see there are a series of nerves that come down through that, and they can have the outer myelin or the inner axon that can be involved. It's another description of the same thing as it's coming through. And in over on the right-hand side, you will see the cross section of the nerve that has that center axon and the outer structure of the myelin sheath. And then the, on the left side, you will see that that's the nerve body, which remember we said is can be within the spinal cord itself, but it's the little axon that works its way all the way out to the body for, uh, for the movement in the case of motor. All right, so that's a description of the anatomy. That lays our groundwork for, what's, for what we're going to be looking at. So the next question is, what is cauda equina syndrome? We've described where it is, so it is basically a loss of the function of the nerves in the cauda equina. It's not a loss of the function of the nerves in the spinal cord, and it's not a loss of the nerves of the, fun of the function of the nerves down the legs. It's right in that area where you have that horse's tail that I showed you that particular diagram. Down at the bottom, you can see that labeled again in this drawing. Okay, you get this loss. What can cause that? Well, you just stop the nerves from functioning from there, and there are a ton of things that can explain it. And I've got this slide up here just to show you that there are a lot of things that can explain it and go through the particulars. But on the next slide, we'll, we'll sort of dice this down, make it a little bit simpler. And the number one cause that we think about for cauda equina syndrome, and if you review the literature, they'll talk a lot about that, is they're going to talk about spinal structural disease. By structural disease, we mean dis. So one of the more common causes is either going to be trauma, where it's structural disease from that. You can see that's on the bottom of the list. Or we're going to talk about a herniated disc that's going to poke out. And we'll show you some a slide. The next slide will show a little bit of that. But you rem remember, we have that cauda equina section with all those nerves going down the spine. If you get some sort of structural change, either from trauma or disc, that pokes out into that area where the cauda equina is, it will cause damage across all the nerves, and you can develop cauda equina syndrome. Second thing that we've got is vascular. Well, these are nerves. They're susceptible to strokes, just like anywhere else in the body. So sometimes you can get hardening of the arteries, the aortic disease in particular. So there are some structural vascular reasons that can cause a tiny stroke to it that would not have evidence of a herniated disc, but it would become vascular. Tumors. People can get cancers down in the spine, either in the bones of the spine or actually within the cauda equina, within the, uh, the, the spinal canal itself that can do it. Inflammatory, again, we'll show you a little bit of a slide of that, but inflammatory, remember it's a peripheral nerve. MS is an inflammatory disease where you get peripheral disease up in the brain, where you can get peripheral disease down in the nerves. And we can see this either in the nerves in the arms and the legs, but we can see it in the cauda equina nerves that it can happen. Infectious, if you get a bad infection that disrupts those nerves, there's always iatrogenic. This is if medications or surgical procedures can do this. And again, trauma we mentioned as part of the spinal structural lesion. If you get a fracture down there, that impacts the nerves. But the spinal structural and the trauma is far and away the most likely, the, the most common causes. Uh, but the other ones are to be aware of because those people won't have changes on MRI or may have subtle changes. This is showing you a couple of slides. This one's a little bit difficult to see because it's dark, but if you look over in that section A, you can see that probably best. You can see the nice little cauda equina. Remember how I showed you that picture before, how the nerves are just coming down, coming down. You got the spinal cord at the top of that section A, and in the midsection is all the little tiny nerves working their way down. And then when you get to where that arrow is, you can see the little disc poking out. And what has it done? It has narrowed the canal so that if you look over in section B, you can see that that disc is extruded little piece of disc material that has jammed into the canal and has just crushed all of the nerves, which would produce cauda equina. 
for those people who have chronic cauda equina and they're told that they have no disc lesions, this is a case of something that's very different. Okay, what this is, this is a contrasted MRI of the cauda equina. So you don't see all of that perfect picture that we saw with the last one. But what you do see with this one, because of the way the images are doing, is that little speckling that you can see, that bright speckling, okay? Underneath there is all of the nerves, and that's, you can see some of the linear dark sort of coloring, that's the nerves, but some of them have this contrast enhancement. So this person was injected with contrast, and the contrast goes to any nerves that are that are having inflammation or are a lot of blood vessels going on because of that irritation. And that's what you're going to see in this. This is, and this person does not have a herniated disc. So it's not a structural or trauma related. It is an inflammatory related from a demyelin, well, a, a inflammatory lesion of the cauda equina. Okay. So now that we understand where the cauda equina is, what its structure looks like, and what causes cauda equina syndrome, disease in there. How do we define it? Well, loss of function of the nerves in the cauda equina. And here is a basic definition that a lot of people use to define for cauda equina syndrome. Number one, dysfunction of mictration, that's urination, defecation, that's stools, or sexual dysfunction with no other explanation. Okay. Second, number two, altered sensation in the saddle area with possible neurologic deficits in the lower limbs, motor or sensory or reflex changes. Okay, a lot of words through these things, but working it out, you could see we've got two different areas. You go back to what I was talking about in the anatomy, you can see how this parallels perfectly with the cauda equina. You, down in that sacral area, in that lower sacral area, that's where you're approaching urinary, bowel, bladder, stool control. So one of the hallmarks of cauda equina is that loss of bowel and bladder. In fact, something called a post-void residual has about a 90% sensitivity to pick this up. Now, a lot of things can cause an increased post-void residual and bladder problems, so you have to exclude a lot of different things before you do it. But that is something that is very much associated with cauda equina syndrome. Remember when I showed you that sensory map and I talked about that saddle area that went through the sacral, lower lumbar into the sacral and would span up both legs on the saddle and go down uh, through the bowel and bladder areas? Well, that's where you get the altered sensorium and that's where they're talking about the sensory changes. There can be some weakness in there, but you don't necessarily see it in everybody. The reflexes, must, the reflexes that we check when we tap your ankles with a hammer, they can be reduced, but they may not be. But these are the two symptoms that a lot of people in a lot of the clinical trials that they use for their definition of a cauda equina. Although, again, the symptoms can vary. Expanding on that a little bit more, we said loss of function of the nerves in the cauda equina. These are going to present with, number one, back pain. If you got a herniated disc, if you've got inflammation, irritation in the back, back pain can be something that can present. Not everybody with cauda equina gets back pain, but you can see back pain. We mentioned the bowel and bladder dysfunction that can be a factor in this. We mentioned that saddle anesthesia and numbness that can be. Weakness in the legs can be. And then the sexual dysfunction. These are all the symptoms that are part of cauda equina but not necessarily does everybody get all of these symptoms. That's why we have that other definition for the key symptoms, and then this is expanding it out to other symptoms that can play a role. Okay, these are a couple of slides that I'm going to go through right now that are going to be looking at some acute cauda equina. So I want to keep in mind that this is not chronic cauda equina. We'll talk a little bit more about that tomorrow. This is more focused on somebody who's had a herniated disc who showed up in the emergency room, MRI evidence of cauda equina, met that definition that we talked about with those two points, and, uh, and was felt to have cauda equina. They went back and they did what they call this retrospective chart review. So they looked at about 75 patients that had presented with cauda equina, and they wanted to look, what are we seeing in these people? 
Okay, it's biased because this is not finding those idiopathic ones where it's inflammatory. This is focused mostly on the structural disc type cauda equina. But you can see as we look in this, there was the sciatica. You can see that in the top, the saddle area, anesthesia, the defecation, the mctrician problems. So the bowel, the bladder, the sphincter tension, they actually went through and checked how strong the ability to contract the, the anal sphincter was, and it was reduced and documented in another of these, and the sexual dysfunction. So this is backing up a lot of those things that they will see in people who present. Didn't talk a lot about reflexes. We were talking about the presentation, the signs and symptoms that we're presenting. So again, looking at the cauda equina, you can see these are all lower motor nerve, lower areas. Okay, again, what is cauda equina in summary? It is the loss of function of peripheral nerves in multiple causes and multiple symptoms. When is it not cauda equina? That's your next question, okay? Because a lot of people will have back pain. A lot of people may have bowel or bladder dysfunction. Is it always cauda equina? Well, remember, this is why I spent that time on the anatomy, because you can get spinal cord lesions that can be midway in the spinal cord or up in the neck that can produce some of these symptoms. Well, how are, what are their symptoms going to be? Well, you'll get neck pain. That's number one. So neck pain is not part of cauda equina. See back pain with it. If it's neck pain, you have to think about other things. Leg stiffness. Leg stiffness is what we call a sign of some upper motor nerve dysfunction. Remember I separated upper and lower motor nerves. That's going to be a sign of upper motor nerve dysfunction. So that's, that's going to, if you see brisk reflexes, stiffness, spasticity, these are signs of upper motor nerve dysfunction. Arm symptoms, that's an easy one. It can't be in the cauda equina, which is in the low back, if you've got symptoms in the arm. Similarly, sensory changes in the trunk. That's if somebody's had a bad accident and they get spinal cord damage in their mid chest, they're going to get sensory symptoms in their trunk. Cauda equina, again, it's that saddle area. Breathing changes. The nerves that go to your breathing muscles are very high up in the neck, so you're not going to see those in a cauda equina. And lastly, I put down here speech and swallowing changes should not be part of cauda equina. So when you get evaluated for this cauda equina syndrome, they're going to want to know about these other symptoms because if they're present, they're going to lead them to somewhere else. This is a little more of descriptions of when it's not caught equina. This is this would be neuropathy. And you can see with the figures over there, they don't have that saddle area numbness. In fact, in these three ones, they have some arm symptoms, which would exclude them. So we have to think about, is it peripheral neuropathy when we try to sort out that caught equina? Because the caught equina is a peripheral nerve, but a very, very proximal peripheral nerve. So we've got to look for that and see if this is more of a distal peripheral nerve as we're seeing here. That distal symmetric is something we would see with diabetes, the mononeuropathies, that's carpal tunnel syndrome we would see, and then the inflammatory and the multiplex type that we can see. These are other symptoms that we would go through. You don't have to read e either of these, but you or read any of these. But as you can see, it's talking about the unilateral symptoms. Cauda equina is going to be involving both of the legs with the bowel and bladder. This reviews some of the causes that we had talked about for the spinal cord type of damage. So again, reviewing our symptoms. What is cauda equina? Well, we reviewed the anatomy. We went through where the cauda equina is. We went through a discussion about um, how that is a very proximal lower motor nerve, peripheral nerve, so damage that can do that. You can damage the nerve itself. You can damage the, ner the nerve itself within the axon. That's the central core of the nerve. Or you can damage the nerve on the outside. Or if it's structural, you can damage the entire nerve. And as a result, you get these lower motor nerve symptoms that we went through the diagnosis for each of those. And that's pretty much sort of our basics of cauda equina. If you understand that, then it can help you as we go through what we're looking for and what we're trying to do. I will say that there is still a lot of research that needs to be done. What I've talked about is what we teach all our medical students and residents about cauda equina syndrome so they can try to identify it in the emergency room. But characterizing this more, we need to we need to do more research in order to understand the broad spect the spectrum of this, because all of it, as I mentioned, is focused on the trauma related cause. So thank you for listening to me, and we will uh, 
See you again tomorrow to talk a little bit more of chronic cauda equina syndrome. Thank you.